Chairman, we're live. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, welcome um, to the Education Libraries and Lifelong Learning um, Scrutiny Panel. Um, my name is Anthony Rowlands. Uh, I'm a, a member of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee uh, and I'm a County Councillor for St Albans East. Um, I shall be chairing this session. I'd like to welcome um, the nine County Councillors who are on this panel along with um, representatives from the churches and parent governors and also um, officers and um, executive members. Um, this is a really important exercise um, in the municipal year. It's one of a number of panels that look at all aspects of the council's work. Um, our um, proceedings are if anybody's not on mute, if maybe you could mute, that would be really helpful. Um, um, I presume so, uh, uh, one of the lines, what are called um, key lines of inquiry, uh, Chloe's. Fortunately, there is no member of the County Council called Chloe, so there won't be um, confusion that might otherwise arise. So if you heard, hear the um, word Chloe, it's key lines of inquiry. And those are the... Um, um, a series of issues that have been considered by this panel in a, in, in previous in a previous meeting um, from the um, uh, remit uh, that falls under education, libraries and lifelong learning. Um, the way that this is conducted is that um, members of the panel will ask particular questions and then there will be a response from um, either the executive member and or um, uh, the senior officers of the council. Um, may I plead uh, for concision um, from everyone, um, members, um, including myself, uh, uh, executive members and, and uh, directors. Uh, we have just short of 90 minutes to cover quite a lot of different um, issues. Uh, we will then pull together um, uh, some of the key issues into recommendations and they then get forwarded to the Overview and Scrutiny Committee, which meets on the 6th of February. Um, this meeting is webcast, so it's available um, to, to, to the wider public. Um, so, uh, the only other initial request I have is that when uh, colleagues speak for the first time, if you can just say your councillor for wherever, um, uh, or if you're an officer, um, your, your remit, that would be helpful. So um, the first section we're going to look at is um, SEND. Uh, I shall ask just the first question but before that I've already made one mistake which is I'm um, due to ask Terry Duris. Terry um, welcome uh, just to to offer a few um, introductory thoughts. Terry you're on mute. There we go. Thank Very you very much time. indeed. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, Terry Durris, Cabinet Member for Education, Libraries, Lifelong Learning and Localism and Member for Bridgewater. Um, firstly, some good news uh, that yesterday the DfE finally approved the start date for the James Mark Special Academy in September 2023, based at Roman Fields until the new school building is constructed, something we've been waiting for for a long time. Secondly, I can report that the very latest Ofsted inspections show that all of our 13 maintained secondary schools are good or outstanding and 94.6% of our maintained primaries are also good and outstanding, making an overall figure of 95.1%. Great news. Turning now to my cabinet portfolio, it's one of the widest ranging. You'll see that it covers education, libraries, localism and lifelong learning. The education budget alone is worth more than £1.2 billion funded from the dedicated schools grant, of which £979 million goes directly to schools, £180 million to high level needs, £99 million to early years and £7 million to the central block. Hertfordshire County Council administers the DSG along with Schools Forum in its statutory role. This presents a challenge and a risk insofar as we must be aware of the government funding and constraints for longer term planning in the face of some uncertainty and the move to the national funding formula. Our school leaders engage with MPs to promote our need for fairer funding 
uh, for school pupil numbers. Um, and these are also variable subject to demographics and the birth rate, which is currently falling, presenting a school population impact. You will have heard also that we are fourth lowest funded authority um, in the country for high level needs. And we've communicated with government, government on various occasions in the last four or five years. Educationally emerging from COVID recovery, we are focusing on coming back stronger and narrowing the gap working alongside our colleagues in HFL education. With regard to SEND, I characterise this as children's services, who obviously met this morning, uh, commissioning the need and education, our service, delivering the service. Not without challenge, as we've seen a 15% increase year on year in EHCP's education and healthcare plans. We're providing a, a new special school, the so James Mark Academy, as I've mentioned, a new school in Potter's Bar, rebuilding the Valley School in Stevenage, the relocation and expansion of Breakspear School. We have robust and planned special schools place plasma, pl special schools place strategy due to be refreshed this year. We are creating four secondary special resource provisions and eight primaries uh, coming on stream between now and 20, September 24. In addition, new mainstream schools in Buntingford, Crotsley Danes, three schools in Bishop Stortford, a rebuild of the Bishop Stortford Boys School, um, and also plans for the Gilston development. Turning now to the libraries, we're developing, um, our libraries are developing into places all about books, but not just about books, with other facilities and a variety of additional events and our great baby rhyme time. New library buildings have appeared in Hatfield with refurbishments at Buntingford and Welling Garden City, Rickmansworth, and an investment for a new library in Ware, replacing the existing building. Our numbers are coming back, but equally a growing number engage online. Barclays Bank, as an initiative, have got two pop-up banks in, in two of our libraries. Uh, we've also delivered new library facilities in Berkhamsted, Nebworth and Wheathampstead, plus refurbs at St Albans, Watford, Hitchin and Redbourne. And let's not forget the localism aspect. We look after the maintenance of the Armed Forces Covenant with relations to Northwood headquarters. We engage on a regular basis with the Hertfordshire Association of Parish and Town Councils and attend local strategic partnership meetings. And finally, we keep a watchful eye over the members' locality budget. All 78 members um, have £10,000, as you will know, and to be spent on local issues. Um, a very, very rapid um, response um, and introduction, Chair, uh, because I know you wanted to keep it within two minutes and I hope I've been able to get somewhere towards that level. Um, I, I was going to say you did the, 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 your introductory comments are, are an uh, exception. It was four minutes, but that was fine. And I think you, you covered a lot of ground and that's very helpful, Terry. Um, okay. Right. I shall ask the first question. Um, and and uh, the, the plea is obviously, I know that some of these questions are quite wide ranging, but uh, for the answers to be um, to be um, concise. Um, SEND strategy, how will the success of the um, SEND transformation programme be measured? Um, I am joined, by the way, by Simon Newland and uh, Hero Slynn, and I will turn probably in a moment to Hero Slynn to add something to this. The, the main essence is to make sure that our young people who do have educational health care plans following from special needs uh, get the right sort of education in the right sort of, in the right circumstances um, that's appropriate for them. And that's why I made a point in my introductory remarks about the new special schools that are coming on stream. But in terms of the actual detail, I, I think I'm going to hand over at this moment to Hero, um, who has the role for um, Director for Inclusion, yes. which this falls within. Yes, yeah, the first question. What is the first question? And I'll turn the speaker on. Thank you. Sorry. Hero, welcome. So, hello. Thank you, Anthony. I appreciate that. Uh, yes, yeah, so as Terry said, I'm here at Rose Slynn. I'm the Director for Inclusion and Skills. So my portfolio covers the integrated services for learning, which um, is the educational psychologist, the specialist teachers, the statutory SEND service, the access and inclusion teams, which includes oversight of the children missing education, elective home education, children who've been excluded, 
children who are in receipt of tuition because of medical needs um, and children um, who are not attending school or school for the appropriate amount of time um, as well. Um, I've also got the virtual school within the portfolio and you focus uh, on the measurement. The key the question people. was how will it be measured? That's what yeah, we're sorry, on. Anthony. I was just giving an instruction so yeah. people could knew that it wasn't just send that I yeah. covered because I'm very keen to stress that send is everybody's business. But a newly developed um, in-house team is the send improvement and transformation service. And we've had a new head of service join us um, two weeks ago, and that is uh, Samantha Rostam. Um, and the question, therefore, around the success of the SEND transformation being measured, the SEND strategy was co-produced with families and partners and young people uh, one year ago now. And within that SEND strategy, there are specific pages, five pages that detail the KPIs that we will be measured against. Um, so that's really important to have as your reference, because that is what we are using. Um, there are five key areas in the strategy. Um, they focus on tailoring, enabling, provision, collaboration and succeeding for children and young people. And if I give you some examples of some of the KPIs listed there, um, we've got uh, under tailoring the percentage of children and young people whose needs are met locally for, for both EHCP and SEND support. Um, and then under enabling, as, a, as, a, as another point, We've got the uptake of professional training identified that is recommended across health, social care and education. Now, what we've been doing with, with the new service, and I say it's new because it is now a permanent part of the structure and obviously was a part that the IP uh, agreed to uh, this year um, but to replace kind of the interim structures that we had in place before. Um, what we've been working on is redefining the strategic oversight of that strategy. So we've got a newly formed Send and Inclusion Strategic Board and sitting underneath that strategy and that strategic board and our evaluation of where we are in terms of Send is a Send delivery plan. And within that, um, we are prioritising those KPIs that are in the strategy uh, because we, with, with families predominantly and young people, to make sure that okay. we are addressing the things that are most important to them first. Thank you. Um, I'm going yeah. to stop you there. I, mean, I did okay. indicate in contributions, I hope, will be maximum two minutes. Um, that's helpful. I think that's a particularly the, the co-production and the KPIs and the information you gave there. That That's helpful. I'm going to move on to the, the second question. There may be issues that have just been mentioned that uh, colleagues want to raise as we proceed. But um, the, the second question, um, Teresa, in I think the absence of Asif, I don't think yeah. Asif's here. Thank I haven't you, seen Theresa. Asif arrive. Yeah, thank you very much. Hello. Um, so I'm Theresa Heritage. I'm the member for Harpenden South West. So um, in in your opening speech, Terry, you referenced a new school. I didn't quite catch which which one that was, and also the reducing birth rate. So um, what progress has been made on a, on the proposed new schools? Because there's more than one. What and what steps are being taken to ensure that these expansions of for send provision um, align with the current forecasts and demand? Uh, the, the current forecast obviously um, continues to rise, although we would hope that the demand um, or the um, fulfillment of the demand will actually start to decrease to some extent because it's our ambition and our aim to get as many young people into mainstream schools rather than special schools um, because we feel that they will get a, a rounded education. Those who aren't, uh, if you like, on the on the edges, on the on the borderline of, of those uh, SEND requirements. Uh, the, the new school says a new school which is being planned of, of um, in the old Sunnybank area um, of Sunnybank School in Potter's Bar. Um, as I mentioned, we've got the school, um, the James Marks Academy, which is secondary school for 60 people, 60 young people in Welling Garden City. And we've got the relocation of Breakspear School uh, from Kings Langley to Cropsley Green with an increase in the uh, um, pupil number from 97 to 210 going forward. So that's just some of them. There are other schools which at the moment we are looking for sites um, to get a distribution of schools across the county. Um, it's worth mentioning, I think, that 
we we have to recognize that young people the, nowadays have different needs and different um, particular foci so that a school is not just a special school per se it may be a, a pni school or it may be an sld school or an mld school um, there are unique circumstances for unique young people Thank you. Thank, thank you for that answer. I'm not looking at if other colleagues have, as it were, supplementary questions they want to pose. Just put put your hand up, and I'll try and spot in the um, uh, on the on the on the laptop. Uh, okay, um, Chris Lloyd. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, for the third question. Yeah, I'm going to slightly reword it because the wording is quite lengthy. Um, but yeah, thank you, Terry, for commenting on the fact that, you know, funding wise, we are one of the worst um, from central government. So fully appreciate that. But particularly want to look at the education healthcare plans. I know from speaking to officers, both at meetings and outside of meetings, that we were hoping to see that come down dramatically uh, this quarter. So what I would like to know is where, where are we at the moment? Because I think some of the challenges you have will be on staff recruitment, not that you haven't got the money to fund it. And that's the second part of the question I wanted to ask. So I don't know whether you or one of the officers wants to come in on that one. I'll, I'll come in first of all, and then I'll go back to Hero if I may. Um, yeah, we did have a challenge, a, a significant challenge during the summer of last year, um, and we found ourselves in need of recruiting a number of people. Um, to the best of my knowledge, we are now um, at strength, although it has to be said, and quite openly, we have a number of people who are new to the profession, and they will also need some training to make sure that they fulfil their roles um, fully, but they are carefully managed, um, and we we are pleased to have them with us. And and I'm comforted in the fact that we are getting back, if we're not already back, to the number the number that we need. Um, in terms of the the numbers of EHCP, they have reduced. Um, the out the backlog has reduced. The number of complaints has reduced. But I suspect that Hero is probably able to give you a greater level of detail on that briefly. Yes, in the final quarter of this year, we issued 681 EHCPs between in October and December. And in the previous nine months, we issued 674. So we issued more than the previous three quarters put together. So that shows the effort that's gone into um, getting those plans out. I know the original question, what we've asked, what we've put in place to address that. And Terry is obviously right to recognise that we have an inexperienced new team. Uh, so we put in a comprehensive induction programme, some really, really tight sort of target setting and oversight, even up to sort of director level in terms of looking at how that's working and a renewed focus on quality and cross team working as well to enable that. We're not completely out of the woods yet, and it's important for me to note that um, although Terry is correct around the statutory SEND team staffing, a uh, significant pressure is under us for the recruitment of educational psychologists, which I know I've raised with members previously. Um, we do still have a number of vacancies there, and obviously we need educational psychologists to conduct the EHC needs assessment before we can issue an EHC plan. So that is a significant pressure that we are addressing uh, currently. Can I just also mention, Chris, that we have introduced the uh, the Ask Sally. I nearly said the Aunt Sally, but the Ask <laughs> Sally, which is an opportunity for um, SEN uh, members of staff in schools. If they have an issue and a problem and they want some uh, some advice, they can actually call up this line and they will get advice um, on that particular circumstance. And that has proved uh, my understanding is that that has proved very popular and very well received in the in the schools. Um, Chris, back to you, and then I'll call in John. Yeah, I'll be very brief. Thank thank you both for your answers. Good to see that progress. I know you've been working extremely hard. I was aware of where you had the staffing challenge, hence why I asked the question. So thank you for clarifying that. And I wish you well. And over the next few months, we, we, we are here as county councillors to help support that and ensure that 
we can manage parents' expectations. So what is your plan for how many you hope to do? This is my final question, Chair, in this current quarter. Hero? Yes, thank you. Um, we'd hoped, in terms of the statutory send perspective, to have cleared this backlog, as I think I shared it with members previously during this current quarter. I guess there are some risks around that in, in terms of the pressures on the educational psychologists. Mm. So that's the bit that I'm trying to work through. But I have a meeting with them straight after this with, with them on a regular basis to see what creative me measures we can take to enable those assessments and plans to go out on time. But that remains the risk, really, Chris. To, yeah, to yeah, no, I think, I th yeah, no, I think that's fair. Thank you both very much. Um, back, thank back. you, thank you, Chris. I'm um, John Sloan, and just just introduce yourself, John. You're muted. You're muted. Hi, I'm John Sloan. I'm chair of governors at uh, St Vincent de Paul in Stevenage, and also uh, the representative for the Diocese of Westminster on the Overview and Scrutiny Committee uh, for Education Matters. Uh, so I was just going to ask about. Um, so that's very good about the uh, about the progress on the on the statements. I, I was going to ask about support in schools. So I was very interested in Terry's comments about the helpline, which is news to me. So that's great. Uh, but our, our experience in schools is, is, has been that um, uh, support of schools with with uh, children with challenging behaviour is it does seem to be quite stretched. So has has that has there been issues with staffing or or um, recruitment in those areas? And if so, are, are they are they being addressed? Are you, John, can I just clarify, are you talking about within the county council or are you referring, yeah. if you like, to um, in, in individual schools? Well, I'm, well, I'm talking about, well, 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 both, I guess. I mean, well, I have experience with my school where we, we had, we, our impression was that the support to schools was quite stretched uh, from the county council. So it's so, so both, I guess. OK. Um, I think I'm going to defer that because, if you like, the the the, the professional um, relationship is very much with the officers and the schools. So, um, Hero, can you can you pick this up? Of course. Um, yeah, there are a number of pressures, obviously, on specialist support for schools and for, and for children. Um, I've mentioned already the educational psychologists, but also uh, particularly in therapists, particularly occupational. Uh, therapy as well in terms of that recruitment piece uh, um, around those, although we have got a newly commissioned contract to support. Um, you mentioned particularly challenging behaviours, so it would be related to what the underlying need is. So certainly for those with um, autism or communication interaction needs underlying that challenging behaviour, we do have a specialist teaching service that does support those children, which is a non-statutory service and requirement that we have commissioned you know uh, because, because we recognize there's a need there and we also commission our education support centers to provide outreach for those with social emotional mental health needs that contract is currently under review ready for recommissioning uh, next september because we recognize john there has been a an escalation in need in that those particular areas that obviously is putting pressure on on all services including schools um, but there is a support out there and we're just constantly trying to review and improve as the needs of our children change and uh, develop over time. Indeed right. John, uh, at least one of our education support centres has been nationally recognised for the work that it does. Okay that's great. I, I think I'm just in, in, in terms of the our, our experience I think we, we just felt that uh, we, we had to exclude a child our first exclusion for a child for a child who had uh, who, was, who was demonstrating uh, violent behavior and we just we just felt we weren't able to cope as a school but we weren't able to access any any additional support uh for for that child yeah, so it may be that it's exceptional circumstances but or or, or, yeah. diff, or yeah, I, I, I i can't go into all I, the all I, I the ins so. and outs but it's just an impression really John, I think uh, thank you for the raising it as a, as a general issue, which I think thank obviously here uh, uh, Ontario uh, have endeavoured to address. Obviously, if there's a, a specific yeah. um, concern, I'm sure that there are other other areas offline that you should should follow that up. Chair, um, if, I, if I if I yes. may very brief, Money, very briefly just yes, say do. that I think what we're seeing is the the results and the impact of COVID and and lockdown yeah. and the if you like the um, the the impact that that's had on young people and in fact their social engagement um and the and the way they they have 
um, come out of that. And that's one of the reasons why HFL have been working so hard with coming back stronger and narrowing the gap. Oh, yes, thank you. Thank that's you. a thread that runs through a lot of this panel and, and also the children and young peoples. Um, uh, let's therefore we'll, we'll take an, just I made a note of the point, in particular point about educational psychologists. Um, mm. Let's then move on, and we've got in a way two the two consecutive questions about um, home school transport. But the first one, uh, and I'm going to turn to Jeff, um, is is spe specifically about SEND. So over to you, Jeff. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, Jeff Jones, member for Bantingford, and uh, <laughs> member. Uh, on the Overview and Scrutiny Committee, currently a member on the Overview and Scrutiny, and previously a member on education and libraries and localism. Um, my question and concerns really are reg regarding uh, home to school transport, um, which is an ever increasing budget. I think I'm writing in reading it um, for SEND, it's 22.3 million, and we're adding a another 7 million to that in um, the upcoming budget. Um, but, but really, my, my, um, I just wonder, this, this is a, an extremely very high budget for transport. And if you add in mainstream school budget as well, it's, it's a massive um, cost to the council. Um, obviously, rising all the time because of the um, um, use of taxis etc um, and I just wonder there's any, any work being done at looking at alternative arrangements for home to school transport and that's probably um, with SEND and mainstream schools. Yeah thank you. I, th I think it's fair to say Jeff that um, home to school transport is something which is constantly under review um, and what you may not know is that we are currently out uh, or about to go out to a consultation, an eight week consultation on home to school transport um, with just to try and rationalise some of the elements that have, shall we say, grown over the years and have got slightly out of kilter, perhaps. Um, yeah. to bring them back into into a formalised state. And some of those actually. Uh, would include well, I think one of the most important elements of that is um, to encourage parents and carers to uh, take advantage of personal travel budgets um, which actually allows them to make their own arrangements it's a great deal less expensive than Hertfordshire County Council having to provide the transport uh, and it does give them that greater level of freedom if they're using their own vehicles so that's one there's also a question over the um, effectiveness of personal assistance um, accompanying young people in Hertfordshire um, um, vehicles. Um, we've got, we're looking at route optimization to reduce the, the number of miles that uh, vehicles go if it's um, contracted services, looking at seeing if we can actually have more children in any one vehicle than we do at the present time. There's a whole range of things that we're looking at um, going forward, but uh, it, I agree with you. I agree with you. Every year, it seems that the budget for and the cost of home to school transport increases. And it's mm. something that we do um, have to address going forward. I don't know whether Simon wants to add anything to that in particular, or maybe so, even maybe. Rachel. Yeah, uh, just a couple of things, really. I mean, there's, there's Simon, two parts you just introduce to... yourself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I'm the, I'm the Director of Education, so my responsibilities include uh, school standards, the operations, the school system and home school transport, amongst other things. So I, my role complements that of HERO. Um, in relation to home school transport, yeah, I mean, this is a problem that we're all worried about, and it's a big yeah. problem on the national stage as well as locally. Um, I think there are two halves to... Uh, managing and mitigating the the increase in in cost, and one half is the supply side, if you like, and the other half is the, is the demand side. And of those, the demand side management, I think, is the most important, and that's what here here I can talk about in in a second. Um, on the supply side, Terry's mentioned most of the key initiatives um, and minor policy changes. Um, but we are uh, continually working with our colleagues in. Uh, environment who operate the transport system for us yeah. um, to to 
try to address those cost pressures coming out of the increased costs of drivers and fuel and vehicles um, and, and, and optimise the use of the vehicles that we do have. And we are looking at uh, you know, innovative things um, to help parents get their children to school um, themselves. Um, one of them is, a, is an app called Home Run, which is a kind of lift sharing app, which we are uh, we're trialling in, in Hartford and Ware, and that's a way of trying to put parents in touch with each other so they can share journeys. So, you know, we're not just looking at the mechanics of vehicles, we're looking at how can we work with parents and change their behaviour. Um, but actually pivotal to it all is the number of journeys um, and the distances, and that is where our uh, our SEM strategy is, is most significant. So I'll just hand over to Hero. Yes, to I'm just going to interrupt. Yeah, that's very helpful. I'm just going to draw in Leslie because, in a way, this does overlap with the next question because you've already started talking about mitigations. And I'll I'll um, ask um, Hero just to uh, say a little bit more. But Leslie, do you just want to ask your question so we've got it on the table? Yes, yes, of course. Um, I was just going to ask what's going what's being done to ensure the impact of the increased home to school transport demand on the environmental sustainability and that that's mitigated. I believe you've already started to speak about that. So I'll let you continue. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Yeah, over to you, Hero. Hero. Shall I just finish dealing with Let's the, do, the uh, it probably yeah. flows better if I deal with it and then go to Hero. Um, so we've talked about how to minimise vehicle use. Um, we are, um, you know, obviously there's a question about, about if and when we move to electric vehicles. And that's very live in our minds. Um, at the kind of large vehicle end of the spectrum, there are not technological solutions available yet. So that's that's kind of a kind of later in this decade thing. Um, on the small vehicle end, uh, we do think that operators will start to explore um, moving to electrical vehicles, as, as all of us will be over the next few years. At the moment, we're, no, we're not specifying that um, <clears throat> because that would uh, substantially limit the, the suppliers that we have available to us in a tight market. But we also know that, that currently electrical vehicles, electric vehicle transport of that sort would be a lot more expensive. Um, so the main the main way of making our transport system more sustainable is the demand side. It's shorter journeys and less children travelling. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just a brief further comment here, because I think there may be one or two other members who've got questions. OK, no problem. Just to say, as Simon said, it very much aligns with the SEND strategy and the KPIs I referenced earlier. So the two of them in there talk about the percentage of children and people whose needs are met locally and also our focus on driving down the, those that are placed outside of Hertfordshire. And that also aligns with the special school strategy that Terry spoke about as well, so that we can make sure we've got the right local provision for children to reduce the, those that traveling basically um, so that all these things align and to the same outcome and the special schools placed strategy is due for review uh, in 2023 good thank you um, can, I just, can i just say tony just just finishing off on my yeah, question please. um yeah i mean very good to see that um there is work being done rather than just throwing money at it every every budget um, every year increasing the budget and that um, yeah personal travel budgets that sounds a good scheme um, route optimization and uh, of course electric vehicles so yeah thank you very much for that thank you for the question yes and obviously the figures we've got in our in the budget integrated plan papers are are, extra, are extraordinary and and it's absolutely yeah. right that this is a top priority um any other colleagues got any related questions I uh, haven't seen it yet. One hand's gone up. John? But it's just perhaps following up on the sustainability aspect. Um, so could, could I just ask what um, what support has been given to schools to um, to help them uh, with, their, with the sustainability agenda? And in particular, what support they're being given to reduce their energy consumption? Uh, yeah, I don't want to get too widely into uh, this is focused on transport so we're just focusing on the uh, the response on transport to that question 
uh, and, 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 and Anthony, can I can I have yeah, a please. 10 second comment yes. to say that we have engaged with Salix to get a wide range of uh, energy saving opportunities yeah. within schools. If your school hasn't signed up to it, come back to me and I'll yeah. put you in the right direction. Thank you. Um, I think it was specifically on transport, John, the first part of your question, wasn't it? I don't know whether any officer wants just to sort of respond to that, but um, I think the, as, the, as the, Terry's the sustainability Terry's answer, aspect. Was, yes, the, 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 the authority is trying to be as proactive as possible in communicating with schools to encourage them to, uh, to, to, to go down the right lines. Well, there's also the encouragement to actually walk the last 500 yeah. yards or, yeah. or or something similar. Um, you don't have to actually have a car take you to the front door of your school. You can actually walk a little way, perhaps. To be assured, I suspect every county councillor, John, would say three cheers for that, because the amount of problems we have to deal with with people going to park <laughs> outside their schools is probably the one thing that we all have in common. Um, Absolutely. Right. Um, I've got there's a the sort of connected question um leslie um question number six do you want to come in with your second question yes fine i didn't introduce myself before apologies i'm the member for goths oak and berry green um when demand in a local area for schools are not sufficient to enable school provision to remain viable leading to a school closure what will be done to avoid the resultant increase in demand from holding to school transport i think the first thing to say leslie is that the last thing that anybody wants to do is to see a school closed. Um, we did see a school closed in Ware, in Wareside last last year. Um, but the, the simple fact there is that the numbers were so low, it, it simply wasn't viable. And so when you get to a situation where the numbers are so low, I would probably say that the impact on the, the environment for the relocation of uh, pupils is 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 marginal. Um, having said that, um, we would always, always um, endeavour to relocate those children in the nearest school to them. And it's also fair to say, and I think it's worth making the point, that thinking about that particular school that closed and any other small, very small schools, is that frequently to maintain their sustainability, they actually draw in pupils from a wider area. And so actually they are, shall we say, contributing to the, um, the the detriment to the environment by coming in from the other side of the nearest town simply because this that particular school might be very small it might have a particular focus on the way it treats young people so there are a number of things it's not just a question of how you relocate children it's not just a question of the sustainability of the school um, per se we nobody wants to see a school closed and and particularly in village schools um it may be that there are opportunities for schools to engage with each other and share some of the costs thank, thank you. you for that anybody else want to i think that's a comprehensive answer um could i just ask a question which slightly perhaps relates back to the previous questions um, but it was mentioned, I think, by Simon when you talked about national policy. I'm just thinking in terms of home school transport, we, we are um, um, you know, a very numerous county. Um, geographically, we may not be the biggest. There must be other counties where the cost of home to school transport is, is an even greater burden. And to what extent do we um, look at good practice elsewhere? in aiding us to try and find ways of um, uh, mitigating the increased costs, which are obviously um, dramatic. Um, Simon, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a pretty active um, kind of um, East of England officer group, which meets to talk about um, homeschool transport and talks about policy, uh, you know, the policy decisions that are, that are, 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 are possible. Um, so ideas are exchanged there and we feed our views into um, the national associations in their dialogue with uh, government. And of course, you know, there's a live, a live discussion about what changes might be made to um, uh, national regulation and provisions around transport to mitigate the impact of cost increases. Um, but yeah, it's, as I said, it's a problem which many other authorities share. Um, recently, um, uh, I think members had some discussions with Buckinghamshire, who have 
perhaps an even more acute home school transport budget pr problem than we do. Uh, but there are no, you know, the legislation within which we operate is very clear cut. Um, the external market is challenging and therefore there are no easy answers to this. Indeed. No, thank you for that answer. Anthony, um, I, can I just make, yes, uh, do, straying yeah. into highways, um, don't forget we have the um, demand responsive transport being rolled out or already operating in the east of the county. And that runs from, I think, seven in the morning to seven in the evening. And that gives a, a young people an opportunity to catch a local bus if they're, if it's available to get to school. Good. Thank you. At seven o'clock in the morning. I'm sure they'll be keen, but it's from seven o'clock. Thank you. Um, what, what, uh, number seven. Yeah, seven again. Um, Chris Lloyd. OK, thank you. Just quickly on, on that one. I think one of the challenge, challenges that we have in Hertfordshire, obviously, I, sorry, I should have introduced myself initially, um, Chairman. I'm Chris Lloyd from Croxley Green, which is in between Watford and Rickman. Worth and obviously we, we you know we have far denser population than in other parts of the county so I think at this end of the county I'd be and have done for years encourage parents to try and pick schools where their children can you know either walk or use existing public transport and I will continue to do that that option probably isn't available but what I'd like to do is focus the school places question uh rather than say the whole of the county, but just pick the example of sort of Hartsmere um, and um, Hartsmere and Watford and Three Rivers, where what Watford are practically at capacity. Obviously, they've got capacity to reopen Tulpits, what the school in Tulpits Lane, because we agreed to reduce the pan. But I was wanting to know what modelling has been done with all the building that's going on in Watford and where we're expecting the numbers to go. If this is a too detailed question, Chairman, I'm happy to accept uh, a written answer because I have, Jay, I have, I've tried to put a bit more detail onto the question about school demand. I think if we, if the answers, I think, do need to be uh, about the general process of modelling, et cetera. If yep. you've got a specific, then I'm sure officers can. Right. Well, and, and well they're, they're okay. So what, so yeah. what modelling is going on? Because obviously mm. numbers go up and down yeah. uh, and it's the impact then of new build onto our projection on the, on the numbers. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah. Well, we have the school place planning team that actually looks at numbers. Um, if it's a primary sector, um, and early years, it, it is pretty much based on on uh, the birth rate um, and information from doctors and, and uh, medical practitioners. If it's a secondary school, that gives us a little bit more time. And what we try and do, we have uh, most recently, I think we, we've opened or we opened the uh, Catherine Warrington School in in Harpenden or Wheat Hampstead, which has been a huge success, I have to say. Um, and we we've we, done that. Um, in we 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 constantly look at numbers. We constantly look at uh, the developments. We work with the local planning authority um, that if there's a development coming up of a, s a sufficient size, to make sure that there is space provided, um, space and section 106 contributions provided to uh, allow us to develop a school. And, and that applies very much at the moment. And um, we're seeing that in Broxbourne in, 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 uh, in that part of the county where there's a lot of development going on. In terms of Watford, it has to be said very briefly that Watford is, is, is the, it's the smallest borough in the country. We know that. Um, there's no space for it. Um, it's building residential accommodation. There's no space for it in, uh, to have schools. And it's looking, um, as we are, to uh, the east to Hartsmere to see if there's a facilities and space in that area to accommodate new schools, which would. Um, and if you like, there's a domino effect that if you actually move some of the children into their nearest school, then it frees up the next school to take other children. OK, thank you, Terry. Very I'm complicated. Just gonna in, it's um, very complicated. Just, I'm going I'm to finish. Uh, I've got Peter, I've got in, in this order, I've got Jeff and Peter wanting to ask something. I'm going to uh, draw them in and then um, if there's a further response, we'll take it then. So, Jeff. 
Yes, uh, I mean, all it was, it, it was um, uh, um, Terry's comment that he started off with there on the Hearts Link. So sorry to go back to Hopeless School oh. Transport. Um, but um, I mean, we, we, we had the data from Hearts Links um, for the, uh, their highest users of the service. And uh, number one on the list, I mean, I think we'd all expect it to be used by, let's say, uh, the uh, our senior citizens um, in in uh, the area. But the number one on the list was um, students using the service um, to Freeman College in in okay. in my in my <laughs> division, which I found really interesting. So it just shows you that the, the evidence is there um, for demand response travel, perhaps for school you know school use. That, that, that was just a comment, really. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, uh, thank you Anthony. Um, yeah, j just a, uh, an observation, really, in that, you know, we're talking about um, home to school transport and also um, school demand um, in, in that uh, just the point, really, that, that the nearest school to where you live is not necessarily the right school for your child. And... <clears throat> I think it's just worth remembering that in that, um, yeah, wherever we build schools, it doesn't mean to say that uh, everybody who lives in that area is going to send their child to that school. It might not be the right school for the child. So there will always be some some movement across. In, in, indeed. Thank you. Yes, I think that's a, that's a fair comment in, in general. Um, look, um, so thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I'm just pursuing the question we maybe have had the answer in general terms from Terry very clearly about the work that's done by the, the school provision department so I think we can move on I'm trying to keep an eye on the clock um, to question eight which I think is back to you Jeff this is some um, collaboration in, in difficult times you're you're muted. sorry sorry one second I'd, um, question eight Jeff yeah thank you um yeah um the willingness of schools to work in uh, collaboration with the county, um, it, um, the county council, is seen as a key risk given the challenges of school funding and pressure on the schools is growing from matters such as strained industrial relations. Um, in light of these growing pressures, is there sufficient provision in the budget to manage adequately this identified risk? Well, I think there are two issues there. Uh, one, the first one, uh, Jeff, is the relationship that Hertfordshire County Council and, and officers in the education team um, have with schools. And in that context, I, I would actually um, push back on, on, to some extent, on the assertion that you're making. I think the relationship between schools and Hertfordshire County Council and schools and uh, Hearts for Learning um, is actually very good. Um, I think that uh, our our officers work extremely hard with schools. I think that the schools re um, relate to that, um, and and it's there. We are all there for one purpose only: educating our young people. We're not there for any other reason. That's the reason we're there. It's for the young people. In terms of you've mentioned the industrial relations. Um, I think you're alluding to to um, things of a national basis. Um, yeah. I would I would suggest to you that the relationship that we have with the representatives of the teaching unions in Hertfordshire and some may wish to comment is actually very good. Um, we respect their views. We may not agree with their views, but that's another matter. But we do respect their views, and I think they respect the position that we find ourselves in. Um, and and the re as I say. The, I think the, the 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 communication is is good in terms of the funding. That's much more difficult in a sense mm. because um, <laughs> schools have a budget, and as you'll know, the the budget is set out uh, by um, the ORPU, the age weighted pupil unit. It's set out by a number of other factors, and so if you like, there isn't um, a great deal that we can do, but we can try and support. Uh, the school financial planning by our hearts for learning um, and of course schools can't set deficit budgets and if they do set a deficit budget then they actually have to set it in the clear expectation that they will actually come back into a, um, a positive financial position rather than having a deficit going forward. We do have some schools that do have deficits and we're working very hard to actually get them back into a positive financial position. 
But Simon, did you want to add anything to that? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very good question because um, you know, actually the relationship between us and our schools is is absolutely pivotal to the success of not just mainstream education in the county, but also um, provision for children with special educational needs. And, and it's the kind of, I don't think money can substitute for it. Mm. Um, we mm. need schools actively to work with us and we will actively work with schools, as Sir Terry said, to provide the best possible pattern of provision. Um, and we depend on schools playing their full and proper role in provision for children with SEND and provision for vulnerable children, um, because if they don't do that, we can't do our, our job. So we, we devote a lot of attention to, to, to developing that relationship. Um, and you know, through this year's uh, high level needs budget process, you know, we, we, we engage very closely with schools representatives and with schools on schools forum. Um, and we pay great regard to, you know, what we know are the financial pressures on mainstream schools in terms of children with complex needs. So that's an area of budget we've protected. But if if our relationship with schools were to go, then I think we would be in deep, yeah. in deep difficulty. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you both Thanks. for those answers. Thanks I've got that. now, I'm going to, uh, John wanted to ask a question. John Sloan. All right, thank you. Uh, so thank you for all that. It's all very interesting. Um, one of the key pressures on um, on budgets at the moment is um, supply teachers. Uh, so it's through, it's through supply through agencies. So it does seem to be becoming more difficult to recruit teachers um, at the moment. I mean, Jo Fisher mentioned in the children's services uh, session this morning that she was developing a recruitment strategy for social workers to proclaim how wonderful it is to come and work in Hertfordshire. Are, are we doing anything similar for for teachers. Thank you for that question, John. It's one I posed as well as in, in another forum. Um, who wants to respond on that? I'm I'm going to respond and say that I'm handing it directly to Simon Newland. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's not just teachers. Actually, uh, we we we've got this problem within children's services about about recruiting a whole range of professional and paraprofessional staff. Schools have got both teachers and teaching assistants, and teaching assistants play a really important role, well, in primary schools and in special schools. So we, for a long time, have worked with Hearts for Learning to try different ways of promoting um, teaching as a career and promoting Hertfordshire as a, a venue. Um, we've tried running conferences and things like that, and the main um, no, we, one of the things that we're doing is through uh, supporting schools through the Teaching Hearts website, which we promote to people as a as an avenue through which you can find out uh, what's going on in terms of teaching opportunities um, in Hertfordshire. So we, we're doing that. Um, we work with our partners in the uh, in the teaching schools, the teaching school hubs, and that's the um, the Sandringham based. Um, Alban Trust that's one and then the Chiltern, Chiltern Trust that's the other and they provide um, newly qualified teaching, newly qualified teacher support programmes and HFL support further the training and development of newly qualified teachers because you know not only do we need to get people into the profession but we need to keep them in when we've got there. Um, and most recently we're looking with Hearts for Learning at a kind of promotional campaigns through advertising and social media and so on to make sure that people within the county are aware of the the uh, the rewarding nature and the opportunities that are open to people to be teaching assistants, learning support assistants in a number of, of areas. So um, I think we're doing quite a lot. We're always thinking about what more can we do. Uh, but again, you know, this is a national problem, particularly in specialist uh, in shortage areas, especially shortage areas. Um, the, you know, it's like thank painting you. the fourth road bridge. We have to keep going at it all the time. OK, thank, thank you, um, Simon, for, for elaborating. And, and thank you, John, for the question. That is that is a, has been a theme across a number of these panels. Uh, it won't surprise you. Um, but I think it's a, it's extraordinarily important one in terms of uh, ensuring that, that our public services have have the staff they need, um, and without the staff, um, there will be struggles. So thank you for raising that, and maybe that's and something. Anthony, we need I, th to I think if I may, I think 
I think John was actually suggesting um, that we might create our own supply agency. Um, I'm not aware that we have any plans to do that. Um, and I think it would probably be another another a avenue um, that would yeah. would probably be less be best left, albeit expensively, um, to the agencies that are already operating. Yeah, right. Well, it's an interesting <laughs> idea, Terry. It was what I was suggesting. It was more about are we are we putting something out there about advertising how you know Harpertshire as a as a good place for teachers yeah. to come and come and. Oh, we absolutely, that, we, we absolutely are. We absolutely are. Yeah, and okay, that's the case across a whole range of different areas of work the council does. But it's it's a point very well made and one that will be Thank picked you. up. What I'm going to do is I'm going to um, we're going to do question nine. I'll call in Theresa. Then my my sense is that we've slightly covered some of the things under 10, 11, 12 capital schemes, dedicated schools grant. Uh, I'm actually going to then move, move on to libraries. If we have time, we'll come back to those questions 10, 11, 12, but I'm conscious we've covered one or two aspects of them and we need to make sure we cover the waterfront of the portfolio. So I'm having quite do question nine and then I think um, we'll move on to the libraries and Peter. So question nine, um, Teresa. OK, thanks. Yeah, um, this is more. This is around vulnerable children in quotes. Um, what steps are being taken to reduce the risk of vulnerable, vulnerable young people losing educational opportunities as a result of pressure on school budgets? I'm also thinking about the virtual school here as well, please. Well, the virtual school actually all sits within children's services. Oh, OK, well, yeah, OK. I know that Hero yeah. knows the answer, but... Um, Hero. All right, I'm, I'm, if, if you know that Hero it. knows... Hero, no, Hero. Hero, go. You're, you're, mute. you're mute. You're muted. Mute. Keep up, Simon. Yeah, sorry, that is my fault. It's not here. <laughs> I'm controlling the button. I'm not doing it very well. Um, I think I mean, we were expecting uh, uh, a question for Hero. Been asked, uh, that, it was, sorry, was being volunteered I said, for the answer. You you decide, but but just give us an answer. So, so Simon's going to ask her initially, and then I'll follow around the bit about the virtual school. Yeah. So um, there's, there's there's kind of several le levels to this. One is the partnership that we've just talked about and its significance in. Uh, you know, working with schools for each of us to play our correct respective roles around vulnerable children and to make sure our services are properly joined up. Um, but of course, for schools to play their role, they need to be appropriately supported and they need to be appropriately resourced. Um, and I talked earlier on about how, you know, we're trying to make sure that the children with SEND, um, uh, uh, many of whom are vulnerable, we are adequately resourcing mainstream schools to, to look after those children. Uh, and, you know, over the last five years, I think we've increased our, our spend on complex needs in mainstream schools from about six million um, to around 30 million. So there's been a huge increase in the financial support that we've provided to schools in relation to those vulnerable children and children with SEN. Uh, we've talked about the, Sam, the uh, Ask Sally line and Hero can talk about the other support services that we offer. Um, but we also work with schools um, on an institutional level uh, to encourage and support them in, in um, their work. And again, in particular, in relation to inclusion and send and inclusion, we have a programme of visits which uh, HFL takes to uh, undertakes on our behalf and every school is visited or offered a visit on a three-year cycle to uh, review with them their uh, send and inclusion policies. So there's a set of things that we yeah. do um, but here so, I might want to comment on support services. So and can, can, I just, can I just ask Simon, do you think there are any vulnerable children that are missing out? Uh, yes, um, I mean, one of our one of our uh, concerns, our continuing concerns, is uh, children missing education. A kind of defined category of children who, you know, we know are not uh, receiving the education that they they ought to be receiving. Yeah, but um, we don't have that, that statute. We we don't have any way to control that, though, do we? No, we don't. Well, there's a, there's a whole load of things that we are doing to seek to um, bring those children back into appropriate provision. 
uh, but also to work with schools to minimise exclusions so that uh, you know children don't drop out of the school system in that way in the first first place. But th those things are in hero's arena, so I'll... I'll okay. I'll, okay. I'm, I'm going to ask over. the hero to be very brief because I must move on to libraries by 2.20. I will, Auntie, no problem. Um, yeah, just to say, obviously, children missing education are a key concern, but also a key priority, <laughs> important to say. So we're really thinking about across all these teams, children missing education, virtual schools, SEND, about how, and schools obviously is a huge partner in this, how we can align our agendas under one achievement for all strategy type inclusion strategy that really focuses on keeping those most vulnerable in education and closing that attainment gap and inclusion gap, I will say, around attendance and exclusion as well. Um, That's you. fine. Thank okay, you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, as I said, I'm going to move on um, straight to libraries. So, Peter, do you want to ask the first of your two questions? Yes, uh, thank you, Anthony. Um, currently, no viable solution has been identified for several of the 11 libraries um, identified as top priority for relocation uh, or reprovision. So what solutions have been explored and what access will be available for residents if they are to be closed? We're, we are not looking at closing libraries. That's the first thing. Um, we welcome Simon Aries, who is uh, also joining us now. Um, we have actually worked hard to um, create a new library. We bought, we bought um, the, the premises in Ware High Street for the relocation of the Ware Library from a property which is not fit for a library purpose as we see it. We undertook an arrangement with the developers in Berkhamsted for a new library. Um, but looking at, and we've also looked at other sites um, potentially, but there are an, very few sites around. I have been very clear that I have said that if we're going to have a library, it needs to be on a high street, uh, high street frontage with good footfall. There's no point in tucking it away somewhere else, even though there might be a bit of land available. Um, but we are we're constantly on the lookout for li for for opportunities to uh, improve and develop the library buildings, um, but they don't come up very frequently. And if you know of one, Peter, yeah. then let us know. Okay, thank you. Yeah, working oh, with local you. members, local yeah, knowledge. If, if, if I do, I will. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the, the other question. Sorry. Yes, carry on, Peter. Oh, ask the other question. Uh, the, the other question I got is um, the library service uh, service uh, doesn't have direct relationships with consultants and contractors during property related projects which can cause added complexity and risk in not achieving planned outcomes. But what's being done to avoid such problems in the future? We have our own design and uh, construction uh, team, DCT, um, who operate for us um, in a professional capacity. Um, my view is that it's, pro it's much better that we should actually have that facility in-house staffed by professional people rather than actually going out into the marketplace to a commercial operator who will inevitably uh, have a an interest, a commercial interest in uh, the, the costs and they will they will be making quite rightly their own profit. Um, I'm, I'm confident that what we have within the library service and within the county council itself um, sufficient to deal with um, the development of libraries, the refurbishment of libraries. Um, I do know of one particular library um, where we were dealing with an outside contractor um, who didn't, shall we say, um, uh, act in the best interests necessarily, um, although they uh, ultimately for 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 Hertfordshire. Um, there's always there's always a danger if you're doing a new development that something will pop up. Um, that you weren't aware of, um, and that can even happen in professional circumstances. But the, the short answer is, um, I think we're doing it right. I don't so, know whether Simon Simon Aries wants to uh, uh, add anything to it. Simon, welcome. Just say who you are, if you could. 
Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, Simon Aries, I'm a director and one of my areas of responsibility is libraries and heritage. So yes, um, Terry's right. I think we're doing what we need to do and doing it in the right way. We don't have professional designs across the library service, so obviously we use our colleagues elsewhere in the authority to do. It does add that little bit more complexity, but we work hard to avoid that. Uh, we mitigate that. The library team uh, work very, very closely, hand in glove, really, with the property team during these kind of refurbishments and new developments. So it works well. We always, of course, in the service, want to work quicker than our property colleagues can, but that goes without saying they are working across the authority delivering projects uh, but they do a good job for us. Thank you. I mean, I think you're, what you're the answer you're giving us is there may there may well have been problematical projects in the past, but the the structure you now have in place you feel can can do the job and 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 avoid some of those complications that might have set in. I think, if I may, Anthony, um, mm. there, there there's always the odd problem that occurs, and mm. we see that all the time. Um, and, but I, I think that Peter, um, unless he has some very a range of specific incidences, is painting a, a bleaker picture than actually existed. I, I'm, I'm jumping to Peter's defence insofar as a he is nobly a substitute on this panel and b and therefore was not involved in putting together the original questions, but was given <laughs> the. <laughs> I volunteered him to ask this question. So he's 100 percent innocent of any 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 backstory that is motivating his question. And I leap to his defence as ever. I'm, um, I'm, great, I'm grateful to you, my lad. You, 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 yeah. Fine. Thank you. And thank you, Peter, for asking those. Um, but there are a couple of other questions which John wants to ask about libraries. So, John. Um, um, yeah. Uh, Terry, uh, question you, 15 thanks. is about libraries recovering from COVID. Um, you've talked a bit into an introduction about numbers are coming back, um, uh, but do we know uh, our thought for numbers back to previous levels? And uh, are we have we got plans to get back to pre-COVID levels of engagement and income? Or, is, or are we seeing a, a, a permanent change in the way our libraries are being used? We are, we are getting back to normal. Um, the the number of uh, visits to our libraries are now running at 73% of the pre-COVID numbers um, and the number of uh, items borrowed is running at 90%. So I think that that demonstrates the, the, uh, the impact of the and the popularity of, of libraries. I think it's also fair to say, and I, I say this with um, great deference, that there will be some of our library customers who are sadly no longer with us as a result of COVID. Um, so we have lost some of some of that demographic, if you like. But I'm I'm pleased to see that we're getting the numbers back. I'm equally pleased to see that people are using the online uh, borrow box um, facilities, the online uh, booking facility, etc. I'm also very pleased to see that libraries are being used by other people. Um, I made reference in my opening comments to Barclays Bank, who have actually got pop up um, desks in two of our libraries. And I think this is a great idea. I want I want to see libraries being used as a hub for information as well, not notwithstanding anything from local districts and boroughs. Um, I'm I am confident that we will get our libraries back but people will see our libraries in a in a slightly different way i i made the comment which i've made on numerous occasions before it's all about books but not just about books libraries have got to be much wider and they are doing that and you've only got to go in there in the morning i think it's very it varies on which mornings in which libraries baby rhyme time absolutely brilliant you, um, the leader of the council actually a uh, little while ago was visiting um, the library in Bovingdon and uh, was confronted by the children from the local primary school coming in for a book reading session at, at that time. They're vibrant places. You may not necessarily see people in the afternoon sometimes, but if you go into where the computers are, you'll find a whole host of people doing research using the computers in the libraries uh, for their for their um, examinations and their projects and so on. Yeah, Terry, that's very exciting. And 
yeah, pleased to be pleased to see, uh, which leads me on into the next question, can because as you John, rightly can say, I just hold, hold, hold. Sorry. Oh, yeah, you do your question. Then I, I've got a question. We've got Jeff as well. You do your second question, then we can come back. Go on. on yeah, Terry, um, the, the library plays an important part in, in the community, wherever, wherever we are. And I was quite surprised then to see that that it does say in the budget that there is no you've not given anything, uh, any budget to the libraries to support localism in their local community. Um, and you made reference to the fact that uh, you're relying on this, uh, the 10,000 for the 78 councillors or seem to be. I was surprised we hadn't got that localism budget in, uh, particularly as you, you 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 see that we're £200,000 short on the income you could gain. And I'd have thought um, gaining that income is an important part of that engagement with the local community. Uh, we are. If, if somebody wants, if, if a member wants to contribute anything from his or her locality budget towards a project within the library, that is something which is entirely up to them. Um, as you know, the locality budgets are a are, are very flexible operation. Um, we have to all look at making savings, um, trimming the sales a little bit. Um, and that's a, a point to that. You'll also see that we are looking at creating revenue, um, additional revenue of £100,000 going forward um, that helps to uh, neutralise that that saving. We we The libraries, they do have a budget. Um, it may not be as much as they would like it to be, but they have a budget. And with a level of ingenuity, we have some fantastic library managers who will come up with ingenious schemes around Christmas time to make their libraries look good, to encourage more people into the libraries. We have a promotional facilities that we promote online. Um, if you go on to update me, you'll get you'll get information about libraries. There's an awful lot going on in your local library. Um, oh. And and if you if when you're in there next, um, I would like to think that every every one of our 78 councillors will will make a visit perhaps once a month just to into their local library and say, hi, I'm your local councillor. Yeah, OK, good point. Good point. Um, well, um, Jeff and Leslie, I'll just take your contribution. So Jeff first. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, Terry, I visit my library um, regularly. <laughs> Exactly as you say, I pop in and uh, speak to the manager and the staff and check everything's OK and, um, you know, any issues they want me to take forward. But um, just going back to um, you were talking about the pop up banks, an interesting one that we've got in two of our libraries. Um, you know, bank, banks are closing their branches all, all over the place, as I'm sure we're all um, have suffered with that. And um uh, is it was that an, an initiative that the banks approached the county council about, or was it the other way around? The county council uh, approaching banks and offering that service because obviously there's, there's an income stream there. And and just adding to that, um, we seem to be having the same issue with post office. Um, you know, they're closing branches, etc., looking for new premises, uh, pop ups. That might be another area. It could be something that's already happening at, in our libraries. Perhaps you could, um, you know, just briefly uh, update me on that. Well, I think I think the first thing to say, um, in pat particular reference to uh, post offices and banks, um, where there is money being handled, um, that may not necessarily be the right facility within a library. Having said that. If there is an opportunity, then I, that's something that we would consider. But bearing in, we have to recognise that the positioning of a post office is down to post office counters yeah. limited rather than libraries. Um, in terms of did we approach Barclays or did they approach us? Um, Chairman, I notice that Michelle Murphy is on mm. the line. Yeah. I don't know the answer, but I think Michelle probably will, and she okay. can say it in one sentence. Thank well, you. Michelle, introduce yourself in one sentence and answer the Terry. Over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Michelle Murphy and I'm the head of libraries. Um, Barclays have a national um, scheme, which is Barclays in the community. I think they've developed that in response to their closing of the branches on high streets. So um, it is a national scheme, but they do do it very hyper locally. So, in fact, we were in, we were approached in um, to 
locations and then we took it on and tried to take that as a county-wide approach that's one of the problems we have when people want to go direct to libraries um, so we're, we're dealing with that we've got three locations that offer um, advice to their local communities but it isn't cash handling okay. there you go Jeff. Okay. thank you Excellent. Leslie, they they your, your approached question. us, so that's not to say that if we get a sniff of any opportunity, okay. we yeah. won't approach them. Thank you. Uh, the beauty is, is that, uh, that, uh, that, that, as you said, our libraries are centrally located, so um, yeah. perfect for the community to use um, banking and post office facilities. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And finally, Leslie. As a follow on from that, there is um, a library that is actually has a post office in it in Hoddesdon. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be very successful. I personally have been in there. Um, that works really well. It's quite a large library. That wasn't what I was going to say. I was going to say we go to our local library and we've had author talks there that have been very good. And we've also had local people giving various talks in there. So again, that's another revenue stream and it works really well. And that's Goffs Oak, which is a community library. And I've also been to author talks at Chestnut Library. So they work really well. Um, just praise to the library service thank you, thank for offering that, that. that. That's really good to hear, Leslie. And can I just say that I am I hold the record for being the only person to visit all all 46 libraries in one week in Hertfordshire. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure the, the yeah. Honours Board will take note of that. Um, <laughs> well done. Um, look, seriously, I mean, thank you for those answers. And I mean, your initial uh, comment, um, Terry, there may be users, who, uh, ex users of the library who are no longer with us, but equally, your 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 observation about um, um, baby baby rhymes, and thank you for not offering one, um, is 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 about new new users and and future mm. generations, and that's that's incredibly important that young children uh, get into the habit of, of regarding the library as a place that is important to them for whatever they want to go to do. Um, and if I may, if, if I may, in Hevel Hempstead Library, we have the National Visa um, yes. uh, Facilitation Scheme, which is run by the Home Office, I think it is. Right, um, OK. Um, and that right, provides, two, and that two formal that sections to go um, and, and um, 14 minutes. Um, uh, right, I'm going to ask the question, um, Dan, question 17, which is about archive accreditation. And we're told that in order to retain archive accreditation, it's essential the new archive visitor centre make progress in 22-23. That's in the early parts of the papers. Um, what headway has been made so far this year or to date? Um, but um, elsewhere in the papers, it's Dated that the project has been delayed until 2026 20, 27. Um, those would appear to be contradictory statements. Um, could we find out exactly where we're at and uh, how those two statements can I, be reconciled? I, I'm, going to that? I'm going to introduce the answer and then I'll hand over to Simon Aries for the um, reference to the 26 27. Um, we, are, we are looking at possible sites for the um, new heritage centre. We recognise the importance of having a new heritage centre and the archive centre. Um, I'm not going to say with respect, I'm not going to give any indication of what sites we are looking at or where they might be. It has not been an easy project. Um, but we are very aware of it and we are it is uppermost in our operational thoughts. Simon, do you want to make a comment about 26, 27? Uh, yes, I can do. So, so just to build a little bit on what Terry's just said. So we were busy during 22, 23, as Terry indicated. Uh, what we did during that year basically was eliminate one of the sites we were looking at. Now that sounds like it was sort of going backwards, but it actually is going forwards because we're working through the site selection. So, you know, it's positive. Uh, we're now looking at other sites. Again, we won't go into the details of those. Um, a delay, I'm not sure I'd call it a delay, but what we're now saying is that because of the site selection process, we are aiming to have a new building up and running by 26, 27. 
just want to give a, a health warning on that. Long way to go, of course. The money remains in the capital budget. You'll see that in the integrated plan for this project. So we've got the money. We need to find the site. Uh, Terry asked earlier if any members knew of a new site for libraries. I'd say the same thing here. If no, somebody knows of a new site for a new archive centre, please let us know. Um, thank you for those two answers. Um, uh, a, a couple of questions. Um, one is, am, am I right in thinking, therefore, that uh, the comment in the papers, which is that this will um, be escalated in priority within the resources department, um, still remains correct. You're telling me that, uh, as it were, a, a new approach has been adopted. Um, and that's the first question. So is it is it still a top priority? I, I did hear uppermost in operational thoughts. Um, that's one question. And the second question, of course, is, it, it does what does it, it, it seems to be a, a delay will that in any way imperil our um, classification um, or, or our archive accreditation or are we can we be confident that because we've got something um, in train that accreditation will not be risked Who's there is answer? always a there is always a risk um and Scott Crudgington has put his hand up. So with yeah. your agreement, Chair, I yes, would defer yeah. to Scott because he may have even later news than I have. Yeah. Uh, uh, many thanks, Chair. Yeah, just Scott. yourself. I'm, I'm Scott Crudgington, uh, Deputy Chief Exec Executive Director for Resources, um, uh, responsible for the, uh, the Libraries and Heritage Service as well. Um, just really to pick up the first question rather than the second one, which um, I may need to have uh, the assistance of, of Simon for, is that uh, uh, in terms of the um, the priority that we're placing on finding um, a new location for the service is is that it continues to be one of my uh, agreed priorities uh, within my sort of performance objectives uh, each year that we are going to resolve this issue for the long term for the service. Uh, we've obviously had some twists and turns in relation to site identification, um, but uh, there are still more options available to us uh, and we'll be looking to pursue those over the coming months. Thank you. And then the second. Yeah, and just to pick up. If, if, uh, if, if I just yeah. pick up that initially and then some come in, um, there is always a risk, but I think the important factor is that we would we will be able to demonstrate that we are actively pursuing um, the relocation yeah. of the heritage services and the archive services. Uh, and, um, my question and, of and, was, you know, what, uh, what Simon's view on on the persuasiveness of that contention? Uh, persuasiveness, Simon. Uh, I'm with Terry on this. I think if uh, we can show progress, which we can, and show we're still committed to doing uh, finding a new centre, as Scott said, we've prioritised this work, then hopefully uh, they will understand the difficulties uh, and give us the time we need. So I'm confident we've got the story to tell them, which is a positive one. Uh, who are they? Uh, Julie, Julie Gregson's on the call. If I just ask Julie no, to drop yes, in, let's tell me because I, I, I don't. It, it, yes. it's, it's the archive accreditation. Julie, do you want to help out? Okay. Uh, yes, you. I'm Julie Gregson, Head of Heritage Services. It's the archive accreditation panel who will be making that judgment, yeah. uh, and it ties in with our recognition, recognition by the National Archives as a place of deposit for public records. There you go. Thank you for all those answers. Thank you. Interesting um, uh, and important. Um, I speak as a very, very, very ex history teacher. Um, last, um, I don't think we're probably going to be able to get back to education, but let, uh, Teresa, lifelong learning. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, the IP papers make very little reference to lifelong learning, but refers to a strategy that has been the strategy has been in development for a few years and I appreciate work will have been done. But what has been achieved to assist our care leavers and other young people with life challenges to enable them to find employment and what finance is available for further development? Uh, I know that Hero wants to actually answer this. OK. Yes, yeah, sorry, I've lost Simon, so I have to do the technology as well as myself, so apologies. Um, okay, yes, thank you, uh, Teresa. Um, 
as you are probably aware, the third edition of the Hertfordshire Skills and Employment Strategy was published in July 21. Um, there are several th themes in there and uh, 19 actions um, linked to those. Theme one focuses on the support for young people aged 16 to 24 years in the transition for education to employment. So that's been our focus. Um, we have seen reduced um, NEAT rates for those um, in year 12 and year 13. Um, and we've had a particular focus on those vulnerable groups that are prone to becoming NEAT, so a greater risk of becoming NEAT uh, within that population. Um, so we've seen a reduction in the NEAT rates for children looked after, um, as well as those who were previously uh, attending special schools this year. Um, we have provision for young people at risk of not making a successful transition into post-16 opportunities. And one of those programmes is called the Pathways to Success programme, which has worked with almost 1,300 young people since January 2020 and supported 800, over 800 into either education, employment or training outcomes. Um, there is increased resources to support care leaders, particularly with SEND into work. Um, to further develop a local supported employment initiative, particularly around adults with learning disabilities and or autism into employment. Um, and there's a lot of different funding streams that have been accessed in order to enable those opportunities. Um, so there is a huge focus, really, I think, the fact that we're on the third edition of this strategy and we do have specific team in-house in children's services to kind of plug that gap between education and those opportunities. Simon's left his phone, it's not me, I promise. Thank you. <clears throat> right, okay. We have I'll the... get that. Um, right. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Thank I think you I answered much, it. Yeah, Hero. sorry, Teresa. Thank you. Yeah. No, so no, what, I, what this, I... this is this is all part and parcel of uh, of office life. Um, <laughs> right. Thank you, Teresa. You okay with that answer? Yeah, I was just going to say. You. From what I glean from that is that there's funding pepper potted is it, around in various places, and when the opportunity to obtain a, a grant comes up, it's grabbed, and hopefully yeah, we achieve it. Yeah. Okay. It, it's worth making a point, Teresa, that um, we are part of a trio, um, Hertfordshire County Council, the Department for Work and Pensions and the Local Enterprise Partnership. Um, all, all three partners are, um, contribute to the um, to the, uh, to the, the strategy. The, the strategy. Thank you. Um, yeah. Okay, hey, look, thank you. Look, um, we have four minutes left. I'm going to use my chairman's right, maybe just to go back to one question we didn't pose, uh, which was question 10. I'm, I'll read it out if John forgives me, but it was the expansion of Watford UTC has been cancelled due to DfE not granting approval of extending the age range for the school. Have any alternative solutions been identified in place of this scheme to increase school spaces? I hesitate to say I might be opening a hornet's nest but if someone could just give us a brief answer, because that question was one that we included originally. So who's going to answer that one? It, it's worth making the point that Watford UTC is actually not a Hertfordshire County Council establishment. It is actually a Department for Education establishment. Um, and that's why DfE made the decision not to agree to the expansion. Um, I think the future of Watford UTC is um, in debate at the present time and I think that will be resolved fairly soon. I know that the local MP is particularly interested in it um, and what it might be used for if it doesn't remain as a school in that context um, and I'm scheduled to be meeting with him uh, hopefully during the month of February. Um, in terms of the number of people, the number of students there, it's a fairly small number. It's a, of course, it's University Technical College. It, it does attract a certain type of student, um, particularly able electronically necessarily. Um, but the, 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 the ability of schools in the area to accommodate those children who will not then be joining perhaps um, the University Technical College, um, they will be assimilated into existing schools. Simon has returned. Yeah, I think um, I'm going to pull this. Um, look, thank you. I mean, uh, I think that answer is is a pretty comprehensive one in terms 
of, of where we're at there. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm aware that I will hold on. No, I'm, I'm speaking at the moment. Um, I'm aware that I think at 2.50, the, the world comes to an end and we get cut off. So I'm uh, conscious that it's 2.49 and that um, we have covered all but two of the questions. My humble apologies to, to Jan, who was down to answer questions 11 and 12. I think we covered some, there was certainly one of the, one was answered en route. And I think we, we've talked around some of the other aspects of question 12. So um, apologies if, Jan, you feel that um, a, a, a written answer, as it were, would be appropriate. We can certainly generate that and we can talk about that um, in our next session. So, look, um, um, thank you to um, uh, to members, uh, but also specifically to uh, executive member and um, to officers for their responses. Um, the, the panel reconvenes, I think it's 20 minutes unless someone tells me otherwise, 20 minutes for the scrutiny officers to to to, to compose their thoughts. And then we meet again, um, as someone once said or sung. But look, thank you um, very much indeed. There we go, 250, bang on the dot. <laughs> um,
You're live, Chairman. Thank you and welcome to those who are um, with us for the final section of this uh, uh, education library and lifelong learning scrutiny panel. Um, uh, we've had a, a short intermission to allow our um, scrutiny officers to um, summarize we um, should consider for as our panel's recommendations um, to the main scrutiny committee. So I'm going to turn without any further ado to Joanna um, and uh, Joanna, if you could just maybe introduce yourself and just just explain the the sequence of this particular section. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so um, I will now outline kind of the summary um, and draw out the summary that was drawn out from your discussions you earlier. Uh, sorry, my name is Joanna and I'm the scrutiny officer at Hertfordshire County Council. Um, so yes, I will be drawing out the summary from your discussions um, earlier today. Uh, and then we'll go on to um, recommendations that we've drawn out from your discussions and obviously we'll be presenting them to you for further discussion and comments and feedback as well as any further recommendations you have yourself drawn out from your discussions as well and then also actions that we feel have um, need to be taken or were identified in the discussion. Um, for the for the benefit of clarity the, the the conversation that ensues from um, what you're going to read out is is between the panel members. Yes. Right. Um, so if you could read them out, could you could you do it fairly slowly, um, I, so that if any members want to, um, would you like how you intend to, read, to do it and read it out? Yes, uh, I intend to um, discuss the summary first, so read out my summary, yes. and then move on to the recommendations. Yeah. But I can start with the recommendations if you prefer. Just and, and as long as you do it. Read, Slowly, so I just wondered just wanted if people might want to take notes as you go along. Okay, so you would like me to start with the recommendations? And, chair, you know, chair, just do, do, do the summary, but but speak quite slowly. Okay, if you yes. Could. Chair, chair, in chairman, case what, want to chair, take a note. chairman, can we not have it shared on a screen so that we can actually read it? I, I I'm don't afraid. know. Um, no, it's will... been they've been had twenty minutes. They haven't had time to do that. I'll be sharing, uh, we'll be circulating the recommendations after yes. this evidence session for yeah. further kind yes. of comments yes. and feedback as yeah. well from yourselves. So moving yeah. on to the Thank summary. Sure. So Harpsh County Council is the fourth lowest funded local authority for children and young people with high uh, net level needs. Uh, from following on from this, we heard about the backlog in educational health and care plans and the pressures that children's services face with these. In the summer of 2022, the council had a shortfall um, of educational psychologists and officers and therefore were not able to deliver um, on as many of these e EHCP plans. Uh, this demand has now been met and training is underway of these recruits. Members also heard about um, further pressures to this, um, the school transport, uh, to the council school transport costs and um, an increase in cost and demand for the home school transport, both for SEND and mainstream schools. The service will undertake an eight week consultation to identify ways to mitigate and manage these press pressures. And they are looking at supply and demand through route optimization and increasing capacity, as well as encouraging behavior change among, amongst parents through the home run app. Schools and pupils are also looking at the Hearts Link service to meet this demand. In addition to the shortfall of educational psychologists, members also heard that the recruitment of teachers um, is not meeting demand in Hertfordshire and officers have been de um, delivering promotional campaigns to try and address this. A further concern raised was children missing education. Um, however, the children, children's services are working to minimise um, exclusion and looking to bringing children and young people back into the provision of schools. Children's services are also monitoring the demographics and development, monitoring de demographics and development, uh, and are working closely with the with planning authorities to ensure that there are the correct spaces and number of schools um, being built, and that section 106 contributions um, are, to build their schools are being met. Members also heard how the library service is developing and re uh, refurbishing its services um, and buildings across Hertfordshire and how the service is future proofing itself and ensuring it is fit for purpose and that there is a continued high footfall to these services. Um, library footfall is back to 73% uh, of pre-COVID levels. 
library officers and profit justices are also working very closely um, to mitigate any kind of issues that might arise during the development of new sites. We also heard that library spaces and their usages are being redefined um, and they're becoming information hubs. One such example is the, uh, the use of pop-up banks with Barclays. And we've heard um, a, another key priority um, for the service and resources is finding a new location for the archive visitor centres to ensure that it remains open. That's the kind of summary, the conclusion of my summary, and I'm going to move on to recommendations now. There are three recommendations. Uh, the poll. Any member who thinks anything's been left out of the summary, that's not meant as a contentious question. I think you've done. I mean, it's quite a challenge having to listen to us and and uh, uh, and then then summarise it as we go along. But Teresa. Teresa. Teresa, I think you're on mute. Put my hand up and forgot to unmute. Um, I'd like to have heard something around right. children missing from education, but I'll wait and see what the recommendations are. Thank you. Thank you. I think the only thing that I would have added, um, Joanna, is right at the beginning when we were I asked about the um, measurement of the transformation plans effectiveness and we were told about the KPIs. I thought mm -hmm. that was a really important question. Well, a really important answer. I'm not going to call it so uh, they really will important. feature in our actions. That will feature in our actions. Yeah, but if I, I could. What you're saying. If, and finally, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jeff, I believe just on, Jeff, just yes. Mm -hmm. Commenting on and the summary, is there anything anybody wants to ask? Then we'll move on to the recommendations. Yeah, just just uh, for the home to school transport. Um, I, I think um, what what the council is working on. I'm not sure if you mentioned them all. You know, personal. I think there was four key um, uh, issues that well, not issues, but um, what they record, what they what they're working on. Personal to personal travel budgets. I'm not sure you mentioned that one. Um, and then route optimization. I, yeah, that um, was included in the summary. It was, was it? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the app home run and uh, electric vehicles. I don't think you mentioned that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, uh, thank, you. thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that that those four are included. Yeah, I think that'd be okay. Key um, thank you. Lovely. No, I think you've done, done a good job there, Joanna. Right. Recommendations. Okay. The first one. Over to you. Uh, yeah. Thank you ever so much, Chair. To promote hearts do, as a do place. Them all. You, you just cover them all and then we'll. Right, number one. Okay, right, number one. To promote Hertfordshire as a place to live, work, and develop a career in education, with particular reference to educational psychologists, teachers, and other edu educational staff through a recruitment and marketing strategy. Recommendation two. To Hold explore. On. No, this is why I want you to go a little bit slower because um, there may be a minority of us who have shorthand, and that does not include myself. So you're promoting Hertfordshire, um, it, it, uh, promotion of Hertfordshire as a place to live and work um, with special reference. Um, they're not um, educational psychologists, teachers. Was there something else? Just finish and that one other... off again. And other educational staff. Other educational staff, we understand what you're saying. Right, that's number one. So it's promoting, I'm, I'm not misrepresenting, as a place to live and work. And develop a, a career in education. And develop career, mm -hmm. yes, develop career. Okay, thank you. Right, the second one, going quite slowly. Yep. To explore options. Yep. To expand the support offered to schools with children and young people who present with challenging behaviour through commissioned and in-house services. Behaviour and, and that last, so uh, exploring options for widening the support offered to schools who have children with challenging behaviour and the last part of that so through commissioned and in-house services. Okay. okay. Yeah, through commissioned in-house services. Yeah. And, okay. then the and then the third one. The final one to explore different and innovative and innovative revenue streams to keep libraries at the heart of Hertfordshire communities, to encourage new users and to serve existing users. 
identified. So explore innovative revenue scream, schemes in order to um, just repeat that second part again. Uh, no, I think we got the gist. Innovative revenue streams. Yes. To keep libraries at the heart of Hertfordshire communities. Yeah. To, en to encourage new users. And to serve yes. existing users. Users. Yep. Yep. Interesting. Yep. Okay. So thank you for thank you thank you for those. We we do understand why in an ideal world. <laughs> We'd had had an hour. We could have had those up on the screen, but um, I think we've all got them. And we understand with twenty minutes that you. So um, let me deal with one at a time, just to, and then there'll be a, a, a final question, which is, have we missed anything out? Um, but we obviously are asked to not to have a finite number of um, recommendations. So the first one is is very much focused on this issue of um, Hertfordshire's place to live and work and develop the career development um, with the specifics um, referred to there of educational psychologists. And I think we sort of sense that that, that is, they are so key in a lot of the work to do with the SEND in terms of uh, um, assembling um, uh, as it were cases um teachers and then other educational staff as well um yeah. and for, for need to be elaborated why other educational staff are essential if you're trying to run a school are there any points anybody wants to raise there i believe jeff has his hand up jeff you had your hand up i don't know whether that's for this one or for something yeah, else it could yeah, be legacy sorry. It had remained up, but but just if I could add, um, yeah. So you've got no recommendations on home for school transport. N no, I'm not come back present. to that, Jeff, in a moment. Yep, yep. Uh, uh, I'll pick that up as a potential four if we want to. So the first one, I'm not seeing any any um, as it were dissent, and and what will happen to these is that they will be put together, and and Joanna will come up with a draft final statement from this panel and they will be circulated to everybody so that um, there will be time to reflect though clearly given that we're now meeting and giving our overall assent that is a key stage. Um, the second one um, was um, uh, and here I have to try and read my own handwriting um, was was to explore the way in which um, schools um, uh, or support could be offered to schools who are faced with um, uh, trying to educate and support um, young people, many of whom their challenges have been exacerbated by um, COVID, um, and, and what services there are that could be commissioned or developed in-house. Quite broad brush, but it 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 does ref reflect and refer to some of the discussion we had. Um, uh, Teresa, is that your hand up? Yes, it is. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, um, I was wondering, uh, and I'm not sure it will fit, so it might have to be consideration for another recommendation. Um, something around children missing education, okay. um, because that is a re that is a real challenge. Um, but I I hadn't given any thought to what that recommendation might be. Um, um, so I, I think I think. That's incredibly important. It does closely relate to what Joanna has put forward as the yeah. second recommendation. And, and and what we could do is is add a, a suffix, add another mm -hmm. part to it. And I'm just looking, I'm not seeing anybody dissenting from that. And I, I'd be minded just to say, Theresa, if you want to work out a form of words that encapsulates what you've just okay. said, um, then we would include that because I think that, you know, we know that there are... There are children who are falling, falling completely through the net and, yeah. and we need to have that to focus. OK, so if, if I may, I'll wait until right, Joanne circulates and then I'll, I'll provide. Something. Yes, and then. OK, all right. Yes. Yep. We'll, we'll, we'll send. Sorry, Chair, I think I've lost you. Yeah, and Anthony's um, Wi-Fi yeah. drops yeah, in and yeah. out quite often. Yeah, shall we try? Sh shall we try and finish without him, then? Yeah. <laughs> I believe 
Councillor yep. Heritage, are you deputy in case? Uh, I, I said Councilor I would Rob take yeah, over okay. chairing if we if we lost him. So um, I said in relation to children missing from education, mm -hmm. I'd wait till Joanna circulated the, the full wording of what they're suggesting and see how I could fit something in there. If that's all right, yeah, then you'll all, then you'll all see it because it's very difficult to um, author, as it were, when we're all talking together. I think Anthony's back. I think I'm back. Am I back? Yes. No, I yes. am back. OK, um, I, I agree. I mean, OK, great. So I think we've covered that off and we've, we've there was no dissent from um, acknowledging that Theresa's point was an important one. Um, so we've done we've done two and agreed that. And then three was the uh, reference libraries and there um, again, I think you've sort of picked up the, the threads um, very well. Um, it, it's what, what what innovations can be um, pursued um, to, to, as it were, increase revenue streams, um, uh, which would then help to keep um, libraries at the heart. I know it sounds 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 quite grand, but it is. I think it reflects our conversation with literally, meta, literally and geographically libraries at the heart of communities, um, encouraging new users. I think that was in the conversation. Uh, as well as implicitly, obviously, those who are um, existing users. Is there anything anyone who wants to comment on there? No. Right, so we've got three. Um, and then I think, um, uh, Jeff, you were wondering or, or about to yeah. suggest that something to do with the home to school transport should be included. What have you got in mind? Uh, I've got in mind um, the, the fact that it's such a, um, a huge budget that um, you know work should continue. I know they're already doing it to looking at alternatives to uh, the existing system. Um, alternative, al yeah, al should carry on working for alternative measures to um, you know try and put try and ensure there's there's not so much pressure on the budget don't know what they are but uh, that's i think for officers to to work towards you know they they're doing personal travel budgets which i think is a very good idea and i think yeah. terry was saying that's out for that's going out for consultation um route optimization the app electric vehicles i mean let just encourage them to do further work on it that was all I I'm not trying to put words into your mouth, but I think that I mean, for me, I mean, looking at those figures, they are they are very alarming. The, the, yeah. the amount of money, and you're absolutely right to have uh, highlighted it. So uh, maybe including something like urgently, we want we, this need this work needs to be done sooner rather than later. Um, yeah, it should be a priority. Uh, obviously, you've got say. a consultation which has you know, the consultation is already out, and that has to have a fixed length of time. Of course, it does because there it, it, it's a, it's an extraordinarily important. And, and vital for a lot of young people that the, the transport is available. But um, it's, I would have thought an onus on us to try and ensure that this is a high priority. Yeah. So some not, not of, only just for SEN, yeah. but for, for mainstream schools yes. as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Chris, do you want on this one? Yeah, I would agree with Jeff, as I'm sure Terry would. The, the budget, the amount of money we spend on school transport, both for SEN and for all children is large we you know we do need to look at what we can do to reduce it the clear thing though on send which was stated at the at the panel was we can't claim any savings this year because this policy is to come in in september so you know there is no budget saving relating to it but because of the total amount of the travel budget i do think it needs looking at uh, and some and some of that may mean, you know, lobbying of government for changes of how policies, you know, work on which schools people go to, because actually, you know, we want to be in a situation where children getting to school uh, or hours of when schools meet. But we we need to try and see where, where, where are we spending the money? How can we save money? How can it we can still maintain the educational opportunities? Um, because that, that so, yes, Jeff, I think the wording probably. Yes. W could we ask the officers based yes. on yeah. the comments Jeff Just and I've made to yes. add 
add a new recommendation, but I wouldn't want it to be the fifth recommendation. I'd want it to be the second or the third, because okay. I think from a budget point of view, and my my understanding, and please correct me, those of you who've been councillors for longer, I thought we were trying to look at the budget uh, in particular and where we can make savings because right. uh, um, because I have a second question which doesn't rate to the recommendations because I've not attended one of these before but a lot of our questions were generic sort of questions which we might ask at panel and I would like to suggest that for a future year we are more driven by looking at the numbers and what our policies mean because we're trying to we're trying to make the best use of the the money we've got within our educational pot as you said terry earlier for the interest of the children within hertfordshire so obviously for me one of the priorities is to try and get some more money out of the government so we're no longer number you know the fourth worst if we were to get more money in that area, that might then mean we could pay more to our educational psychologists. Right. So, but, um, but, yeah, well, thank you. So I'm going to narrow down what you just said. I, I don't see any, is there any dissent amongst the panel members that we um, ask Joanna to compose a fourth recommendation mm -hmm. along the lines of the discussion which we've just had? That yeah, Anthony, I'm just, just, just slightly concerned that, uh, you know, we're, we're pushing to find further money when I really think we should be looking certainly at at, at savings or yeah reducing I our think, budget. I think your your um, emphasis on home to school transport was was partly uh, uh, very much geared to that. Uh, I, I, think right. I think we were. I think we were. Sorry. No, 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 no. I'm going to chair this. Um, the um, so I I, don't, I think we were there focusing. I mean the the broader point that that. That Chris then made about you know what we look at and how we look at it. Everybody will have the opportunity, and I'm doing this for the first time, um, to to comment on the process and and whether the, there are better ways of doing it. Um, so I just want to make sure we don't lose this one. Um, so I've got that as a proposition that that some essentially summarising the the conversation about homes to school transport is turned into a recommendation mm -hmm. with I would say some 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 emphasis there that this has this is a priority because of the scale of savings that yeah. we are potentially talking about that's where you're absolutely right Jeff those those figures yeah. are eye-watering yeah. um, and we'd be in dereliction if we didn't um, didn't have it as one of our concerns so I've got four there and I, I suspect we probably would be um, discouraged from having any more than four. I, I, I hope they can all be passed forward with equal emphasis. Um, now, is there anything anybody else wants to um, say or raise? Um, so the, the wording will be refined. That will then be sent to all of it, all the panel members. And, and please feel free to comment. Um, I guess it'll be some form of um, please do it by. Um, I think, think got, Leslie's got a hand up there. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just going to come to two people now. I've got Leslie, then Artemis. Leslie. Leslie, you're on mute. Yeah. I understand what we're meant to be doing is looking at the budget we've got rather than asking for more money for things. Although mm. in, a, in an ideal world, it'd be great to have as much money as we possibly need. But I think we're meant to be sort of looking at what we've got at the moment and how we can make savings and yeah. make it go as far as we can get. And I mean, I'm all for the homeschool. It, it's eye watering. It, it's crazy and finding ways of doing it better. But I don't think we can do it by asking for money for elsewhere at the moment. No. I agree. Can I, can I just, I, I totally agree I, with Leslie. Yep, there. hold on, yep. Sorry. I, I've got, okay, I'll bring Peter and then I've got Artemis. Yeah. Uh, I think we, we, the one where we, the only one we actually mentioned money is we're looking for innovative additional revenue streams, which I'm sure we're being encouraged. Yeah. So, Peter. Yeah, no, I'll just say, I, I totally agree with Leslie there. I think because if, if we, Look, look more at what we can do with the money we have rather than mm. just keep asking for money, which obviously, yeah, yeah, it would be nice to get more money. But but then we're, 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 we're then just, you know, discussing about things that are within our control rather than everything being a wish list. Um, 
So, you know, I understand what Chris what Chris was saying, but I think about, you know, it's more emphasis on what we do with the money we have and how we can and how we can make that more efficient. Yeah, I have just thank you, Peter. I've just had one of those rather portentous things flash across my screen, which says five more minutes, which I think means we all go into the ether in five minutes. Artemis. Are. Thank Artemis, you, Chair. Hello. Um, I, Welcome. Hello. Um, you better say hello uh, to everybody. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'm the head of scrutiny. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of points to provide some reassurance. So uh, the first thing is, it's not Joanna working away by herself, um, trying to capture your discussions and comments. Um, this is very much about encouraging junior colleagues to step forward. Um, so uh, the other thing, um, uh, Chris, I just wanted to come back to uh, your comment about questions being suited to panel and um, focusing on the budget. Uh, we do do a feedback exercise afterwards. And um, although I have noted your comments, I would very much encourage you to um, feed that back to us as as part of the process that we have of learning from the this iteration of the um, budget scrutiny. And um, again, just to reassure you, you will see a written up version of this. Um, we do do this very quickly. Uh, the recommendations will be uh, then ratified once you've had a final site. Uh, they will be ratified at the meeting of the OSC on the 6th of February. And that's that's how this all moves forward. So thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you for that. That's that's, that's really helpful. I was just going to add one thing and I hope nobody will, uh, this is not meant as a contentious thing either. Um, I'm not asking for the um, issue of the archives to be a recommendation, but I think it would be useful uh, if we could ask for a briefing note because there were clearly reasons, I mean, when I accept yeah. there must be reasons why officers have to be circumspect when one's talking about property and properties. But it was, I, I think it's it's so important and uh, a briefing note to, to the members at some point would be, I think, useful. Okay, um, brilliant. Oh, Sorry, oh, uh, Chair, can I just, because uh, yes, I'm aware indeed. of the timings, we have a couple of actions as well. Uh, so I'll add to that the briefing note regarding the, the archives. Uh, do you yes. mind if I just run through the, the actions quickly? There's three that yes, we've identified. Yes. Brilliant. Um, so for officers to circulate the um, SEND strategy KPIs with members, so they're yes. fully informed of that. Um, for officers also to provide a written response regarding the data modelling of the building of new schools, both SEND and maintained, and whether they are going to meet forecasted demand. And then for officers to share the uh, outcomes of the eight week consultation regarding home to school transport with uh, members as well, including now the briefing note regarding archives. Well done. Thank you. And then you've got the last point point about the archives. Archives. Look, thank you. So, look, um, the members of the panel will reasonably shortly get the recommendations in draft form. Um, please do feel free to respond, um, particularly obviously if you feel they they deviate from what we've discussed. Um, as Artemis has said, um, th there is there is an absolutely necessary um, feedback opportunities um, uh, on the, on this process. Um, so, feel free to to complete those. And um, I've also must thank, and she's remained completely silent, but um, Bria has been the scrutiny support officer to me, as it were, and I'm very grateful to her for um, all the things she's done to ensure that we um, we managed to proceed through our business. So thank you to, to her and to Joanna. Um, thank you for that. That's really quite a task someone hands you that you've got 20 minutes to summarise that lot. Um, and um, you did, did, did so very in a very accomplished way. Um, Artemis, thank you also for your support and thank you colleagues. Um, for your um, attendance, or some of you in some places all day, I think. Um, but thank you very much indeed. I think that's well, it. Thank you, Anthony. You've done a good